here with Dr. Patrick Graham, author, contributor, chief executive officer for We, we Build Concord. Am I pronouncing that correctly? I'm getting tongue tied. We Build, yep. We Build That's Concord. Nice. So what is your role? Like, um, you have a lot going on in Concord and I've been following you for quite some time and I see all of the, the amazing things that you're doing as of now, but you just started this journey last year, correct? Just started actually six months ago. Six so, months. Um, yeah. So this is um, an initiative to try to get more affordable housing. The city of Concord actually had a um, one cent tax um, that they put on the millage, which really is a place of two cents for affordable housing development. And they created an agency to help handle that. And so I got recruited in to try to get that moving as Concord is, is growing very rapidly. Um, not just population, it's the fastest growing city in the Carolinas. Mm -hmm. And um, top, top, the top eight in the nation in terms of growth. And um, what's also interesting is that 68% increase in the black population wow. from 2010 to 2020. So 68% is a lot. Yeah, it is a lot um, because we, when we think of that, we think of Charlotte, not Concord. So right. well, that's an astronomical number. You're also public and social sector leader over 20 years. Uh, can you give us insight on that? So I do a lot of work around issues that I would say are around really justice itself. Mm. Even my housing is around justice. I look at that as a justice issue. Um, so I'm what they call a Jedi practitioner. Mm -hmm. So justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. However, my take on it is, is that justice has to be the end game. Um, at the end of the day, that's the destination. And so um, I have been working in on various policies for a long time. Everything from housing, workforce development, um, recently a lot more also in our judicial system, um, particularly around um, clemency powers to help uh, individuals come home uh, without being over incarcerated, and also the falsely accused. Um, what I've detected, as well as others, is that that number has grown astronomically, um, and unfortunately, there's a diversity into that too. And that is that more African-Americans percentage-wise get falsely accused. Black men in particular, uh, they represent less than 7% of the population, but they account for 47% of those who are falsely accused. You're absolutely correct. Um, and why do you think that is? Or what, why do you know? Well, Black men in general, um, there's some intersectionality that Black men deal with that we don't really discuss in terms of their identity. Um, and we've just become just more expendable, even within the equity movement itself. So there's this sort of notion that um, we just don't matter as much. So I know I veered off topic. However, so okay. <laughs> I know that you're impassioned by that specifically. And then, you know, it is a, there is truth to that. I'm very impassioned about it. And the reason that you're fighting so hard for black men? I think it's because I, overall it impacts our entire community. Black women, um, it puts additional burden there that doesn't have to be there. Um, and I believe that in this day and age, we still look at patriarchy and patriarchal thought as one of the issues that actually really suppresses a lot of our population. And I believe that there is some truth to that, uh, particularly for women. But I think that there's a misconception that black men have somehow fully benefited from patriarchy. And actually, I'll argue that most of the time, not all, but most of the time, they are quite the opposite. Um, in a patriarchal society, if you're going to destroy communities, you destroy them from within. And how you do that is that in a patriarchal society, you, you first attack men. Um, this is why you had higher counts of lynching. 
This is why over the last 20 years, African-American men have had the highest unemployment rate cumulatively. Um, when you look at them across race and gender, this is why also um, even today, um, they are the fastest uh, growing segment of population that experiences suicide. Mm. These are the things that we don't talk about. Um, and it's one of the reasons why I bring attention to it because I, I know that we have so much to fight for for our women. And I believe that there's so much advocacy out there for them, but there's just not enough for this other part of the community that we're gonna need if women and men in our community are gonna succeed. Wow. So you intimidated me. I was like, oh my gosh, because this man is so smart. So I, I just gotta, I gotta come correct with these questions, but just talking to you and hearing your responses is just mind blowing. Um, you know, because you, you're you so well rehearsed in just about everything. Like there is no stone unturned, uh, especially finances, mental health, just overall, anything dealing with race as a whole. You're very knowledgeable about that. So again, I want to thank you for even taking the time to speak with me because I'm definitely getting ready to pluck your brain some more. <laughs> well, so, uh, I mean, I, I, I'll tell you something that this is not um, so much about what I know. I mean, I, I try to still surround myself in a very personal way with um, a few good people, but I also understand intersectionality, mm. meaning I understand our multiple identities, but I also understand how different things intersect, that you, you can't talk about housing without talking about economic justice. Mm -hmm. You can't talk about economic justice without talking about judicial and criminal justice. You can't talk about any of these things without talking about environmental justice. So there's some intersections that occur. Right. And I really think too, for me, particularly with black men and women, but even across the board, I think there are more empathetic paths for us to have uh, more conversation and more acts that um, give us a window into how each other feels, how we um, are impacted, and overall, I hope how we can um, be together as a community and, and, and keep this democracy going. Because at the end of the day, Black folk have been at the heart of what I would call the democracy experiment from day one. And without us, um, you know, you don't have other movements. Without the Freedmen Bureau and ex-slaves trying to get public schools, for example, poor white schools, poor white students, for example, wouldn't have a chance. If you think about civil rights, right? On the back of civil rights came a new woman's movement, a Chicano movement, a gay liberation movement, all of these things where black bodies open doors. That's right. Sometimes through their death <laughs> um, and allow others to walk through a new version of democracy. So I am, um, I'm not just in love with black folks because I'm black. <laughs> or because my mother's back. And when I say black, I'm talking more from the experience. Right. But I'm I'm loving them because they've given so much to this democratic experiment that we call the United States and have really pushed us to actually try to live up to its creeds. And I think that, that to me, you I could be um, an Irishman right now in Ireland, I'm gonna still have that admiration That's right. for, for people who was able to do that under some of the harshest circumstances. And speaking of, um, one of the things that I did read about you that I really liked um, as we talk about identifying with other people and intersecting is um, in the quintessential gentleman, you describe yourself as a cultural mixture of buttery grits and hip hop. 
So tell us about that. <laughs> so, you know, um, I am uh, my mom and my father. Now, my father actually was white. I got right a mixed uh, white heritage out of Levittown, Long Island. One of the, and at the time that they met, one of the most segregated uh, towns in America, right? And then I have my mother, this beautiful brown woman coming off the fields of Alabama. At the age of 16, she uh, graduates high school and, and makes her way up north during the Great Migration. And so she lands in Long Island. Uh, and what's interesting about landing in Long Island, she lands in this little town called Long Beach. In Long Beach, um, the majority of African Americans who lived there when I was coming up, majority of our parents were first generation migrants from the South. Wow. And so here I am growing up in the midst of the 70s and 80s, in the midst of hip hop. I'm literally sometimes my older cousins, some of the times supposed to be babysitting me, taking me to some of these block parties while I'm eight, nine years old in 78 and 79. And, you know, at the same time, I'm leaving um, home and, you know, there's grits, you know, because, you know, we, we all had these Southern roots. And so here I'm in this Northeastern wilderness where which I'm born, but my family's roots are in Alabama. And, um, and those grits were filled with people who fought the Klan, my, members of my family. So there's a certain pride that I carry of having those Southern roots, yet acknowledging growing up as a hip hop intellectual <laughs> and, and embracing that part of myself at the same time. So, you know, it's sort of complex and I, I just never forget what made me think of it is that one day my, um, my brother is playing Tribe Called Quest um, their first album when it dropped. And at the same time, I hear uh, in the background, my mother's gospel coming out at the same time. And I believe it was a Southern group at, at the time. And I can't remember them at this very moment. But the fact was that both of those songs at the time blended and I didn't see any conflict. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, at the end of the day, that, that that's part of my roots. As a matter of fact, the church that I grew up in was started by a Southern migrant in New York. Um, and over 70% of that congregation, and I recorded this in my dissertation, uh, were from the South. Wow. But they changed the landscape in the North. You know, it's interesting you say that, like you, like you said, your dissertation, you were a CEO at the age of 26. That's very young. That's like a lot of a lot of weight on your back uh, to be this this business person, um, not just business executive director at Long Beach Martin Luther King Center in 1995. What work did you do that further further pivoted you onto the path as a freedom fighter, a servant for the Black and Brown and Latina X community? Well, what's interesting is that the Martin Luther King Center, time, if you were the executive director, it was almost like being the black mayor because mm. they had yet to elect a, a black city council person wow. at that time. And um, so I'm this young guy who, um, that was my hometown. I come back because at the time I'm studying for my doctorate. So I get engaged with the Martin Luther King Center because it became defunct. Mm. And so... Um, while it became defunct, I was asked to serve as sort of an interim executive director. And, you know, I'm young, idealistic, don't have a lot of experience, but, um, but had a lot of intuition and had good relationships with community because uh, it's very transparent. Right. Um, and so we revived that center. I grew up in that center. That center actually was named after Dr. King, the agency itself back in 67, as he toured the North um, on some of his anti-poverty campaigns. And um, so those Southerners there decided that they wanted to create a community center that could give both education and, and a cultural experience 
to their young people. And so they named it after him. And um, so I actually, now that I looked back on it, my pride is, is that these were the same people who helped raise me in that community. And so here I was now being able to, in some ways, give a hand up too. Um, you don't often get that that type of opportunity mm. to do something in your hometown. That's right. Um, so that, to me, um, probably set the groundwork for a lot of things. I gained a lot more experience after that, but there's no doubt that it, it gave me the opportunity to really, uh, really learn my grit. Mm. You did. <laughs> <laughs> Here we are. So um, everyone has a hero that they identify with. And this seems this seems like an unfair question, but who do you identify mostly with? Malcolm X, John Lewis, or Martin Luther King Jr.? And why? There is no wrong answer. Right. Well, you know, obviously all of those are, are great men and there were great women such as Fannie Lou and others there who, you know, Fannie Lou actually is, is one of my favorite. But... Um, I admire King for a different reason than most people do. I actually admired King because of what I would call his healthy bravado. Mm -hmm. We're talking about a man who, in the last three years of his life, as a matter of fact, there's a book behind me called At Canaan's Edge. And it really is uh, by Taylor Branch, and it's about the last three years of King's life. And it's actually the most unpopular times of his life. And at the time, he's fighting for poverty or against it. Um, obviously, he has an anti-war message, right? And he's, he's got an economic message that people often ignore. And it doesn't make him popular because what most people wanted, right, from him is the kumbaya Martin Luther King. They said, let's just get along and leave, let you be where you are. Right. Well, that's King said, that's not the dream. You misinterpreted the dream. And so he becomes unpopular at that moment, but rather than sell his soul, he um, actually moves forward with it, knowing that he would begin to lose support hmm. for doing what he knew was just. And oftentimes I feel like um, we have to be able to pursue justice even when it's inconvenient. That's right. The people stop at convenience and um, we can't. So even when it's not convenient, uh, we have to be courageous. And I believe that um, this is someone who would put his body on the line. Think about the fact that oftentimes it was even the police or state troopers who were actually dealing the blows for marches and others. And yet he was out front and could be shot, killed, stabbed at any moment. But yet he still did it. And he did it oftentimes in enemy territory. Mm -hmm. So I, I just, um, I admire that um, because I think that this whole notion of meekness is totally uh, misinterpreted about him. Um, you know, and also, you know, I mean, even for the nonviolence, let's face it, he had armed guards sometime outside his home and right. hotel. So he, let's let's not make any mistakes here. Um, but you know, I, I, I admire him for that. His bravery, Sometimes. bravery in inconvenient times. Right, right. Everybody wants to claim him now, right? Right. But in those in those three years, a lot of his own allies left. But we don't remember that history. Right. We only remember the glorified story. So was there ever a time that you failed at something? What was the crucial or critical lesson you learned? Yeah, so, you know, I, I think one of the biggest um, moments, it was, a, it was a great lesson for me. Um, I often did pretty well with um, reaching out to the community and trying to get input. And I remember in my young uh, start at the MLK Center, maybe about two years in, I was dealing with an issue of uh, drugs in the community. And oftentimes in these community centers, sometimes the dealers themselves 
would be recruiting individuals, etc. So this is very um, touchy subject at the time because you're in a community, you're part of it, and you want to reach those that even sometimes are not serving their own community well. Mm -hmm. And you try to deal with it. And I came up with the idea that because I had a daycare in that community center, that actually it fell under law where you could be uh, receive stiffer sentences for selling drugs near it within a thousand yards because it was like a school. Right. And so I got that, um, brought that to the people's attention. Um, and I remember that the NAACP, some others, were not quite happy with me because they felt like I'd be locking up people more, right? Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, I didn't really think about it in that way. Mm -hmm. I was thinking really about warning and I'm trying to protect these younger kids. And so it was a great lesson for me to really, how we engage community. Now, the good thing is that the story ends well because um, the young lady at the time who was leading there, um, Ends up, as, ends up becoming one of my greatest supporters. And it's because even in what I felt was maybe a hasty move, mm -hmm. and explaining to her the complex difficulty I was facing between trying to shield these young kids and what I was experiencing with some others that I couldn't necessarily control as much. Right. Um, she began to understand the complex dynamics uh, and the pressure that that puts on somebody. And she could tell I genuinely care. So then that sort of changed. We began to sort of collaborate more. Um, interesting enough, as part of that, what I ended up doing was having a meeting with some of the, the lead drug dealers, mm. actually at the center in a room. Uh, it was uh, an interesting time. Um, and as a matter of fact, I don't know how they got hold of it. Long Island Herald actually reported on it. Wow. Somebody, somebody snitched. <laughs> and, um, and so in this meeting, though, uh, we made a pact that uh, that it was off limits. Right. And, um, and they agreed with that. And, um, you know, that's why I can go back there now today and still, you know, have love. Mm-hmm. So would you say your biggest, or I don't know if it's your biggest, but one of your largest failures ended up being your greatest achievement? In some ways, I mean, I think that, you know, you're going to get lemons all the time, whether it's self-inflicted or not. And you have to sometimes make the best of it. Because like I said, justice is not going to come when it's convenient. Right. Um, you know, you're going to get tested at an inconvenient. I swear to God. So, <laughs> so um, I uh, I just think it was just a great lesson that Karen moved forward. Um, and I think that, you know, if, if it was anything that I learned, it was really about how do you actually build better coalitions, um, high and low, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes and not not the most cleansed places. Right. That's um, right. Because community is community. So those those dealers who grew up um, and probably weren't afforded certain opportunities uh, or certain images um, were also part of that community. So I didn't want to exclude them either in the decision. Right. Okay. They, I needed they support. You got you got it ultimately, correct? Got it. Uh, one of the I won't say his name, but he made sure um, that 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 was off limits, and um, I didn't have that trouble since that night. Wow, that's awesome. That's like a sort a story for the books. So, what does equity, equality, and human capital mean to you? Well, you know, when I first think about human assets, first thing I think about is that we all have opportunities to be um, valuable assets if we are nurtured and invested in, in the way that we should be mm -hmm. and afford opportunity. So um, one of the things I am proud of is to coin the term um, an opportunity, not at risk. And um, Literally, a lawyer came and, and filed 
after hearing it after some time for me. And said, so, you know, you need to hold on to this because people, you know, someone may use us, I don't care. So um, what was interesting about that is that that was sort of my philosophy around people. So when I first talked about a human capital, I, I really now have morphed and used the term human asset. Um, it's just the acknowledgement that um, we can use, nurture, develop talent um, at various levels if we provide the opportunity to do so. Uh, and that it will be good for all of us if we do that. Uh, in order for us to even become globally competitive, we have to do it. Um, when I think about equity and equality, though, those are two different things. I still look at equality. People look at it as an approach, but I look at it still as a as a destiny. It's part of justice. Mm -hmm. um, but equity is more to me about acknowledging how we got there, first of all. You know, we look at diversity in a room or in a space, and we don't know how people actually got there. Mm -hmm. And when you think about equity, it's acknowledging that our paths had different obstacles. We had different, um, different barriers to cross. Mm -hmm. And it also is acknowledging too that we have to remove certain barriers in order for people to be able to um, contribute in a way that all of us can benefit from. But I think ultimately too, equity is, I think the most important thing is, is understanding people's journey. That's right. Um, and we just don't often do that. Um, we don't have the, sometimes not even just about the intellectual curiosity, but we don't have this, the spiritual or um, our faith um, in individuals enough to actually want to know more about how they got there. The compassion. Oh yeah, I mean, compassion, I think, grows out of that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think equity, at the end of the day, it's, it's a tool, but it, it means nothing if you don't try to move it towards an end goal of justice and equality. If you don't, then I mean, you, you just talk. Yeah, absolutely correct. And speaking of, what is redlining and why have you fought so hard to educate Blacks and people of minority about this dilemma? Because redlining is um, one of those at one time legal and now one of those de facto ways that we continue to segregate um, our human assets. Mm. And what it also does is it actually is one of the thorns in the side of economic justice. And so what I mean by that is that redlining is when you're actually at one point legally, the federal government, as well as others in realty, literally would draw lines around communities of color and others and list them as undesirable mm. and wouldn't provide loans economic development and community development, none of that would happen in those places. As a matter of fact, um, all federally backed housing loans up until 68, 98% of them went to white people. The other 2% was spread through the rest of the population. Um, and so what that did was is that during that time, particularly the first half of the 20th century, the mass majority of our wealth was developed through housing and land. Actually, um, there was a study by a guy named Ragnalli that first uh, from 1950 over to 2010 that um, when you looked at all net capital gains, net share, it came actually from housing and land. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at today, the uh, Baby boom generation is about to leave about $68 trillion for the heirs. And um, the largest portion of that is from housing wow. and land. And so what's interesting is, is so that you have this redlining. Well, today, 
recent study out of marketplace demonstrated and the department of justice has now picked it up that african americans are 80 percent uh less likely to get a home loan when all things are equal meaning that they have the same credit score income right an ability to repay um, but somehow in this particular instance we've developed algorithms Mm -hmm. um, that sort of try to account for wealth, right, uh, in terms of it being passed on. And it was actually creating a way where it started to discriminate um, against African Americans and other people of color. But African Americans had the highest percentage of this type of, um, of red line, of modern day red line. And so what's interesting about that um, I was talking to the Black News Channel. I said, it's interesting that during the 20th century, basically what you did was you prohibited people from accessing wealth through the ownership of homes and land. Mm -hmm. And then in the 21st century, what you do is punish them for not having access. Wow. So what you do is you punish them for what you did to them. Mm -hmm. That's right. I said, I liken it to falsely accusing someone and putting them in jail and then saying, well, I can't let you get a job because you were in jail. Mm -hmm. But you put me there falsely. It's the same thing. The government crippling its people or the blacks, basically. So affordable housing. That's uh, Concord We Build and the success you're having with that. You just built or signed a contract recently, correct? So we are, we just uh, voted on a couple of um, entities that will help us build, uh, hopefully within this first and second quarter, a little over 30 units for ownership. That's awesome. Um, one of them, will, 26 of them at least, will start in a traditional black community called Logan. Mm -hmm. um, historical community there that has a very low ownership rate. They have a lot of rental needs too, but we started there because at least with the ownership, we can recycle some of that to place into other housing development. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm excited about it. Uh, we were able to actually have a local firm participate and also a regional um, minority black owned firm. Uh, to participate. So, and being able to do that, it sort of puts our money where our mouths are at the same time. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm excited about it. I can't wait for the dirt to start moving. Um, we're in some of the architectural stages now, pre-construction. Um, but pretty, pretty soon, you'll see some photo with some folks gathered around with some hard hats, you know, digging up some dirt. That's fantastic. Like uh, when I was younger, I always wanted to own. And it seemed like uh, with your journey, you know, getting to this point and not just educating people, but working towards everything that you're talking about, this is a, a huge uh, thing for you, right? I mean, it is. You know, this is, um, I mean, this is just part of a journey that, you know, you. I was a workforce guy for a long time. Um, did some entrepreneurial initiative. At one time, helped start a, a bank to to lend to to uh, black and brown communities. Um, at the MLK Center, I was a youth you know, youth service organization at the time, and very community tied. So, I think that now with also some of the skill sets and learn as a, as a senior policy advisor for some municipalities. I am um, going to use all of that knowledge and experience to put into whatever I see fit and, um, and make sure that, uh, that it's equitable. I love that. Like I said, that that was one thing that I always wanted to do when I was growing up is buy a buy property, buy a house. You know, they always tell you don't sell your grandma's house. You know, it's equity in that. And we in the black community don't or didn't understand what that meant until now. 
So thank you for even breaking that down. Um, now, tell us about your role in the renaming of the street KMD MF Doom Way. Why was that such an important accomplishment for the Black culture and hip hop community? Well, you know, I'm, I'm gonna tell you, this is, um, well, there's a couple of things. One, it's personal to me because uh, I called him Doom and, and most of us did before there was an MF Doom. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Daniel Dumoulin and you know we went to school together a very quiet guy um, but it was always cordial and I remember not just being cordial but met back up with him when he was Zeb Love X with KMD in 1989 actually in Charlotte I was attending John C. Smith at the time and they were performing um, there at the old Coliseum on the top of and <laughs> Uh, I think Big Daddy Kane, you had um, MC Search, uh, Third Base, a few other groups that were forming at night. And so they were a part of that. And so him and I meet, and I never forget, you know, it was just as excited to see me as I am them. And um, there's a whole crew from my hometown that actually is part of, of their group. And what I found interesting is that he, I'll never forget this. Uh, what he said to me um, was something like, you are always kind, you are always cool to me, right? Mm -hmm. And it meant a lot because people remember how you make them feel. That's right. And what was interesting is that he's only like a year younger than me, but they, for some reason in their mind, thought I was older. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there was always like this sort of big brother thing that, that came with that. And I was just talking about it literally on some some guys that were uh, in his crew called the Get Yours Posse. Mm -hmm. And they were doing a podcast and we were talking about that. And two of them who also grew up there said, he said, yeah, pal, we just thought you, you was like this uh, almost big brother figure. And yet you're like really our age, <laughs> <laughs> right? So it was an interesting dynamic. Cause I remember one day saying, I said, you do realize I'm only like a year older, right? <laughs> um, and, you know, I said, man, you know, maybe I said, I don't know if it's that I look all or anything. He said, no, no, it's just that, you know, you just, you know, the way that you, you, you carried yourself at the time, we just, you know, it was more of a thing like, because, you know, you were always polite, you know, we just <laughs> didn't cut up around you. It was a weird thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, I got contacted by this brother named Dreads. And he actually came up with the idea of trying to get you know a mime or something named after him. And so they sell the street, but he said, you know, right now I don't know who has the political capital to move this because right now there was a lot of sort of infighting within the black community and the city at the time, you know, tensions around politics. Yet I was away, but still had some um I guess uh, objectivity mm -hmm. uh, is the best way I can put it. And so, um, but I'm definitely was that black community, North Park, all the way, right? Mm -hmm. There's no, no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. And um, so I get involved by doing a petition. I said, I'll start with a petition. I wrote it, published it. Within three weeks, we we're almost at 10,000. Wow. I said, now I'm going to move on with the city, wrote a letter to them, basically summarizing the petition and why they need to do this. And the reason was, is because they ended up doing what most people don't realize is one, he symbolized one of the, the, the best parts of one of the greatest moments in our hip hop history. When you talk about right. eight, the, the late eighties to, to, to mid uh, uh, the late nineties. But he also, um, really had a coalition across uh, racial, ethnic, and religious lines. Mm -hmm. He was a skateboarder too, so he had this sort of following of, of young people who came from all these diverse backgrounds. Some, you know, here he is Muslim, you had some who were Jewish, some who were um, Christian. Um, so there's this sort of coalition that he develops that I think symbolizes what is achievable with even our generation, Generation X. 
And so um, as I'm getting to think about more and more, it was about that. And it was also about our generation and having symbols of our own. Mm -hmm. We had our parents symbols. We had the Martin Luther King Boulevards. Right. We got the Malcolm X Boulevards. But now we needed our own symbols so that people would know that we were there. Mm. Um, and it's generally late baby boomers and really the Generation X itself that gives us hip hop. That's right. We can argue about it. <laughs> <laughs> You're absolutely correct. So you were also pivotal in Save the Robert Green campaign. Tell me about that campaign and how it applies to you. Well, I'll you know, give a special shout out to Dr. McClinney, Madeline McClinney with ExodusFoundation.org, um, right here in Charlotte. But you know, her roots are in, uh, in Richmond. And um, so they came up with this notion of a century of mass clemency. Mm -hmm. um, because what we we're saying is that you had so much over incarceration that um, really you're going to need governors mm -hmm. to step up and use their clemency powers at this point um, until we can really sort out some of the legislation around mm -hmm. some of the sentencing. And so you've seen some sentencing reform starting to occur in some places now. And so we really pushed that notion, though, because we needed to happen more rapidly because people were losing time being locked up. Right. And Robert Wise Green was one of them. Very young, been in prison for 20 some years for, for burglary. And they said malicious wounding of an officer, mm -hmm. which was really sort of misleading because the real deal is this, the officers scraped their knee during the arrest, you know, because they had to chase them. Right, something. right. And, you know, of course, you know, 19, 20 year old kid, I mean, who, who stops than actually just gets arrested without trying to get away. I mean, that's, you know, normal flight, human nature. <laughs> um, right. I never see someone say, catch me and just lock me up. <laughs> but um, but anyway, to spin it long. And so he actually, um, during his time in prison, uh, became sort of this leader there where even the Department of Corrections started to use him to teach others how to get their lives together before they leave. Right, wow. So, of course, we're like, well, if he can do all that, why can't he have it for himself? Mm -hmm. And so we use him as a, one of the, the test cases for this century of mass clemency. Now, my role in that was I wrote a lot of the op-ed and wrote a lot of the sort of policy papers, mm -hmm. um, and even the last one that was written right before he gets out. And so I told him what I would lend is my pen mm -hmm. to this effort outside of um, occasionally my voice. And um, I even at the time made it part of the city of Richmond's equity initiatives. Very touchy for them, right? Because now you, you've got these sort of advocates going against a state system, mm -hmm. um, but yet acknowledging that your city Right. Was being hit very hard by over incarceration. Mm. So um, to get them to go along with that took a little maneuvering, but we got it done. Um, and I'm I'm so happy that as of this this January, he was released mm -hmm. through these efforts. Um, so so big up to the Exodus Foundation to the to the congregations and, and a lot of those groups in, in Richmond, as well as, as obviously us here in, in Charlotte, who um, now will be pursuing some others. Congratulations. Yeah, I'm, I'm very <laughs> happy for him. Yeah, major accomplishment. So let's deep dive into mental health awareness, uh, black women and suicide. And I'm sorry for your loss uh, with Miss Christ. But uh, let's get into it. How do you plan to address the issues about depression and suicide beyond current conversations? Well, you know, I think that, um, you know, first of all, my heart goes out to, to uh, Chesley and her family. Um, I met her uh, through a request of hers. We had a lunch once to talk about social justice and she wanted to know sort of 
what made me tick <laughs> in the area of, of social justice because she saw herself during that. Um, and so that is where that comes, uh, where she comes into play and why I made the statement I did. But I would say that mental health in the black community period is, is um, and you may have seen me write, is, is that thief in the night. Mm -hmm. It is something that, that sneaks up on us. Um, and we are more vulnerable because of all of the trauma we have related to issues of race, class, gender. Interestingly, um, for so many black women, there's a lot of burdens within communities that other women don't have to take on. Right. Um, and access to help. What's interesting now that we have to also discuss is that black males actually now have surpassed all others um, in terms of growth and suicide rates. And so we got to talk about what that's about as well. Um, because I think one of the things that we'll have to do as a community first is have some internal conversations across gender lines around what um, are some of the things that are leading to this. Mm -hmm. You know, access to health, access to mental health, stigmas around mental health, um, as well as not even knowing signs that you're living with something so long. I, I remember talking to this uh, one sister who probably about 20 years older than I am and and um, for a long time, you know, she had high blood pressure, some other things, didn't realize it. And she said, you know, she's always feeling tired, but she began to actually normalize the feeling. Wow. And it wasn't until she finally got help that she realized that you shouldn't feel that way. Right. <laughs> and I, th I think it's the same thing with a lot of issues we deal with mental health. And some of these things too, require professionals uh, both in the mental health field, but also, in, you know, in the medical field. I mean, you know, there's a lot going on too with uh, with individuals with certain chemical imbalances, mm -hmm. other things that cause these things that are really out of their control unless they receive the help they have. And I think the best thing that we can do is first have these conversations and also begin to recognize signs. Right. Now to get educated on signs um, and understand that this is an issue that regardless of, of gender um, is impacting us. And, you know, there's so many things that we talk about in terms of black men, black women. Some things are just black. Right. <laughs> uh, and we kind of just walk down and say, we got to talk about it because at the end of the day, you know, my mother, I've talked to her today about some things going on with her, right? Her health. It's a black woman. She's my mother. I'm her son. We have fathers. We have mothers. We have uncles. We have aunts. We are interconnected. And I don't care um, how those who are, are feeling emasculated and those who feel that there's some ultra feminist try to put it. We need each other. That's right. Point blank. And I'm not having the extremes tell me that we don't. So I don't always get into um, those those games. Now I do deal with issues of gender for women and others when we're talking about some equity issues. Mm -hmm. But there are some things that really are just about us as a collective and we need to, to talk about them together. Right, well, depression, hypertension, the list goes on. You know, that, that needs to be addressed. My sister died from uh, ischemic heart disease, which is from uncontrolled hypertension. And that's really bad in the black community. So, right. you know, that, you know that, I'm sorry. I think ultimately too, you know, as I think about this issue and many of the issues that we're talking about, at the end of the day, I think a lot of it comes down to that we don't just think about the world as complex as it is. We're very binary in our thinking, right? So you're either this or that. Mm -hmm. You're either well or you're not. Right, right. Um, and not understanding all the gray areas that exist in between that can lead to a beautiful star like we've just seen um, who uh, decides that uh, 
um, that she does, would not be here. Right. And so um, I think that that's where we also have to stop uh, in some of our judgment. Because um, ultimately, my greatest enemy, I believe, in this community are what I would call the modern day Pharisees. Um, people who carry so much judgment um, without knowing the evidence. Right. <laughs> and, and understanding the complexity of issues. And um, it's, it really um, hurts us outside of, of some of the extreme views that we see where so many people draw their lines in the mud um, and can no longer hear each other. I think that was the one thing that hurt me the most about her death is um, her being judged the entire time. And then when she passed, it's like, it's a different story, you know, so. Yeah, well, you know, then, you know, every, it's, it's, it's uh, liking it to a uh, pile in the Bible. You get to, you get to wash your hands of it. Mm -hmm. uh, but we all, at some point have to have a responsibility to check on each other and mm -hmm. ask if we're okay. That's right. You are right. So talent in the black and brown community, we talk about this often, but for people that are not part of the conversation, please tell them why this is so important. Well, here's the deal. You know, by 2044, you're going to have a majority minority country. And a lot of the talent is going to come out of these black and brown communities. And we have decisions to make on whether we are still going to be competitive um, globally. And that decision has to be made with some of those young people in mind. Because mm -hmm. without it, you don't. And I'll give you a perfect example of how segregating and dismissing those populations to harm us. In 1990, we ranked sixth in the world for education and health. Mm -hmm. But during that, the 90s, what we did was we gutted three of our desegregation laws and resegregated our education systems, which were part of the first part of our talent pipeline development. Mm -hmm. And so it's segregating those by the time we reach the mid 2000s, we're almost segregated levels beyond where we were in the 60s. Mm -hmm. And that is not just with ethnicity, but also with class, mm -hmm. but particularly for black and brown people. Um, and to give you an example, when you are black and poor, two thirds of you will live in a poor segregated neighborhood. Right. But if you're white and poor, only a third of you. So it still lets you know how race still plays a part in addition to some class, but race will always supersede in, in a lot of our identity politics because our country still has just made so much of its um, foundation on it. And we end up now being ranked because of that 27th in the world in education and health. Mm. So for me, the writing of the wall is clear. The reason in the 20th century that places like a Mississippi or Louisiana, et cetera, would rank low in education and economic development because they tried to suppress too much of their human assets, in this case, black folks and brown folks. Mm -hmm. And so it didn't pan out for them. It won't pan out for us as a nation. If you will. So we have to make a decision. And so while you've got some of these folks out here battling false narratives around critical race theory and all this other nonsense that doesn't actually exist in our education system, particularly at, at the levels that we're talking about, um, we better course correct quickly or else other nations will continue to supersede us. Right. And um, if we're not leading in democracy, 
um, someone will lead in something else. Well, that is a pretty staggering picture, <laughs> for sure. Well, it, it, but the, the good thing is it doesn't have to be. That's true. You are correct. Now, if you can go back and speak to your younger CEO, Patrick Graham, before PhD, <laughs> what key advice would you give him? Um, I really talked to him about how you have to focus on taking care of himself and have as much passion around that as he would trying to help and take care of others. Wow. Because um, there are times when I probably made decisions in my personal life because of some past traumas that I didn't even realize because I was so focused on ensuring that the promises I made to others were fulfilled. Mm -hmm. But I forgot at times about my own self. And so, um, and then that begins to impact others around me. Mm -hmm. So I um, would have that conversation with him so that he would truly understand what what's needed to have the resilience that I would have now with some wisdom that took me a long time to, to acquire and to listen to. Well. You got it now. <laughs> it took a long time, yes. but you got it now. But I got it now. Yes. So um, this is my last question. I know you're sick of me by, to, by, by now. You no, sick of me. <laughs> no, we're good. I'm enjoying you. Thank you. So where can viewers follow you and become immersed with all the work you're doing? And also with We Build Concord, it is a nonprofit. So can people donate? How can they get involved? Yes. So here's two things that are happening. One is that the We Build Concord website is being built as we speak. Mm -hmm. um, so that will be coming live shortly. Two, as far as following me, you can find me on social media um, at Dr. P. Graham on uh, Instagram and Dr. Patrick Graham on Twitter. Um, and I actually will have a uh, own website that will uh, be coming out probably within the next three weeks. Okay. I think they finalized that. So I'll make sure um, to send that to you. Um, but as far as those we build efforts, that website will be developed. We just did the rebranding. Mm -hmm. So obviously we're going through that now. Um, first had to secure that name, uh, get mm -hmm. board and some community members on board with that. And, um, and now we're able to progress to the next phase with that. And it's a big deal because you know, we're talking about six months of time um, to be able to get people to buy into Nate, to rebranding, um, to we develop the land trust within that time period, which normally takes well over a year, sometimes mm -hmm. two years. So there's a lot we did in six months um, to have this up and running. And most uh, land trusts, by the way, uh, wouldn't probably have properties uh, in the amount that we're gonna have be building um, sometimes taking two or three years to even get even half of them. Mm. So I think that we are really um, doing some innovative, uh, quick thinking uh, and taking advantage of the moment. Mm. Um, and ultimately, I would tell everyone that at the end of the day, when you talk about your journey, that as you face things in the now, remember that you were made for this moment. That's right. That your experiences, the wisdom that you gain, um, the intuition now that you can rely on more than when you were younger. Um, it's there for you uh, because you were made made for this, this very time. So viewers, if y'all don't receive it, I do. <laughs> that was for me, Dr. Graham. Okay, so, <laughs> you know, that affirmation, like spot on. So thank you so much. I had fun. Like when I say I was very intimidated because I'm like, well, I've listened to your interviews. I've followed your journey. Um, but you are pretty much 
when I say you're not the smartest person in the world, but you're you're definitely you know your stuff. So in order to interview you, I had to do an awful lot of research. <laughs> Usually I'm just like, oh, okay, this person did this, 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 and I'm done. I had to take several days to to research you to see, okay, he's been doing this for a long time. So what myself, what is making him tick? Like when you think about black excellence and then us being in black history month right at the beginning you fit the bill so thank you so much for being who you are and then just allotting me the time to even dig inside your brain to to figure out some things not everything but enough so i appreciate you thank you so much uh, i appreciate it